Welcome to the virtual session on uh, green existing buildings. Uh, in today's session, we would be going uh, about the key parameters uh, for converting an existing building into a green building. Uh, also, how we can go into the detailing of uh, the documentation, all those uh, parameters, the guidelines, uh, the working sheets will be discussed and deliberated. Also. We yeah, are still a couple of minutes ahead of the schedule, so uh, we will wait for another two to three minutes before the start of the webinar. Once again, welcome you all, and then we'll be back in two minutes. Good morning, friends. Uh, welcome to the virtual session on a green existing building. We are having a sudden surge in the registration. If it is all okay with you, can we further hold for our and finally we will start at a 10 to hope that would be okay. Thank you.
In this uh, virtual session, uh, during COVID-19 scenario, I will be praying and we have been hopeful that you are be safe. So stay home, stay safe. Uh, whenever uh, opportunity, you please stay with your family. Now, I will be taking this opportunity uh, to share that what is been possible in the existing building scenarios uh, when the building is really very old, uh, might be a 10, 20, 30 years of old, and uh, project managers or the facility managers wanted to improve on building their facilities, their infrastructure, and also wanted to make it a, a good build so that the employees, the occupant of the building would also feel good. However, whenever they have been looking at uh, the green building guidelines uh, or they wanted to uh, go ahead with the green building certification, the main is, the myth is, uh, I would say, that whether we need to change the orientation of a building or how can we change the material, how can we change the structure? What about the glazing? Whether it needs to be changed, altered, and so on and so forth. However, uh, the from the feedback of, of a stakeholder, IGBC has also thought and considered that uh, the existing building parameters for uh, green certification should not as uh, the guidelines which would be applicable for a new buildings because in a new building there are many parameters which would be taken care of by the design and the existing buildings they should be evaluated more on their operational performance rather than their designing parameters thus uh, igbc has bring out its own focusing on the operation and maintenance uh, the green building guidelines for, for the existing buildings. Uh, now here there have been many Chinese attendees who have either already registered their project with us for going for a certification or they have been thinking to go for a green building certification for their existing offices. This entire session would be for on the key parameters what would be required for uh, green existing building certification or what all things can be doable in your existing buildings so that it would be stepping forward for this to, uh, to showcase that uh, uh, how it has been possible to convert an existing building into a green building, uh, let me welcome you, Mr. Himanshu Dutta Prajapati, uh, our presenter for the day. Himanshu Prajapati uh, is an engineering graduate, followed by uh, their masters into the green energy technologies. Uh, he's currently handling, uh, I think, more than 100 of uh, existing buildings and in their location for different verticals different segments. Uh, he's also taking care of uh, the data centers, uh, followed by uh, the, the very interesting things which recently we had initiated of a net zero energy building. How to convert an existing buildings into a net zero energy buildings. Himanshu has also having an enormous amount of experience in this segment. Now, uh, along with this, there's a categories of uh, simulation software to improve the energy performance in the uh, existing building. Uh, Himanshu has also uh, taken forward uh, on that. Uh, with this, it will not take more time. I'll ask uh, Himanshu uh, to share his thoughts uh, and uh, uh, let us enlighten uh, on the uh, features which can be incorporated in the existing building. Uh, Mr. Himanshu, please.
Very good morning, all. Thank you, Puneet, for the wonderful introduction. I hope I am audible to everyone. Okay, hoping that I am audible to everyone. I will proceed now. Uh, hopefully, everybody is okay and uh, are keeping safe at their own house, and most of the people are working home. Uh, Please share your presentation. Just a minute. Is this visible? Yeah, it's fine. You can start. Today we are here, uh, we are talking about uh, the green existing building rating system and uh, we would be talking about a few things about the rating system. We would also be uh, talking about the green building movement in India uh, and uh, how it has shaped itself in the last 15, uh, 16 years. Uh, further, we'll be uh, going ahead and talking about what uh, green uh, means for an existing building. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And how we can use the existing building rating system? Green are existing buildings or any type of buildings uh, with the help of the rating system and to benefit ourselves. We would also be discussing about the certification procedure and documentation uh, just for the benefits of the people who have already registered for uh, the rating system. And then we'll go on for qu question and answers for anything related to uh, the certification procedure, EB rating, and anything related to green buildings. So as I've told you, we'll talk about the green buildings, benefits of green buildings, training of existing buildings, the challenges and opportunities, uh, the rating system itself, certification procedure, and documentation. Starting with the IGBC, IGBC, the Indian Green Building Council was founded in uh, 2001 by CII with the sole in vision of uh, enabling sustainable built environment for all. And I'm pretty sure that uh, most of you are already aware of what work IGBC is doing in this front. Uh, till date, we have talked about uh, 25 rating systems in different uh, for different typologies, and that is one of the uh, examples set by us, uh, showcasing that we are addressing uh, all type of built environment when we are talking about sustainability. Okay. IGBC is also a member of World GBC and is one of the founding members of World GBC. Internet issue. CII Saurabhji Godraj Green Business Center is where uh, our headquarters is. This center was inaugurated by uh, late Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam in 2004. And this is one of the key centers for green business. In fact, is called the headquarters of India GBC. Since 2001, uh, when the first green building of India, which is the platinum rated green building of India, was certified, which was 20,000 square feet. We have come a long way. So we have uh, reached 7.16 billion square feet with around 5,900 green building projects of course, in different forms of or different uh, stages of greening, I would say. The 25 uh, rating systems. There are 25 rating systems which are there addressing different types of built environment. So we have uh, commercial uh, rating systems. We have a uh, rating system for residential buildings, transit, built environment for education, industrial, as well as we are now venturing into health and well-being. In fact, uh, we have a rating system called IGBC Health and Well-being, uh, which talks about specifically uh, how to address health and well-being in, in any built environment. 
Uh, here we are specifically talking about the existing building rating system. And uh, very recently, I would also like to point out that we have launched the net zero energy building rating system, uh, talking about uh, the net zero energy for uh, and how a building can achieve the net zero energy performance in operation as well as in design. So green buildings, when you talk about green buildings, green buildings are not new to India. So what uh, we say that green buildings have always been there and the concept of sustainability has always been there. If you talk about our temples, uh, they talk, we talk about all the forts or minars or uh, any, any such structure. You would see they, they used to consume very less in terms of energy. They were quite sustainable. They did not require an HVAC system to run. They had very good ventilation system, daylighting, and others. These are some of the concepts which are already there in such buildings and which we which have come to the green buildings now. Coming to the definition of green building, we define green buildings as a building which conserves natural resources, uses less water, optimizes energy efficiency, generates less waste and provides healthier spaces. It all goes back to how uh, we see sustainability in India. We, we talk about the Panchabhutas, which is, which is the Prithvi, Jal, Agni, Vayu, and Akash. Now this concept is uh, imbibed in all our rating systems where we talk about uh, sustainable sites, we talk about water efficiency, we talk about energy efficiency, indoor environment quality, daylighting, and night cycling. When we compare a green building with a conventional building, it's very hard to differentiate between both of them. Externally, both of them would look the same. The usage will also be the same. However, the difference would be in the way they operate. So green buildings are more aligned towards conserving of natural resources towards human comfort and indoor environment, as well as operational savings. These are the key differences between a green building and a conventional building. Over a period of time, we have uh, spoken about how green buildings would help a particular building uh, in reducing its energy and water cost, or uh, when we talk about uh, operation cost. So uh, we generally say that energy savings uh, to the tune of 40 to 50 percent can be achieved, and water savings up to the tune of 20 to 30 percent can be achieved. So overall, we say uh, green buildings reduce operating cost and optimize life cycle economic performance. Some of the benefits uh, that we have achieved over the years include uh, CO2 reduction. So we have reduced approximately around 12,000 tons of CO2 per million square feet per year. So these are numbers, these are general numbers or an average of all the numbers which we have taken out for the green buildings. Green buildings have also helped in saving energy to the tune of 14,000 megawatt hour per million square feet per annum. These are annual numbers. Water savings of 45,000 kiloliters per million square feet. We have also diverted construction waste from the landfills to the tune of around 450 tons. Green buildings have also helped in installation of more than 200 megawatt of renewable energy, and it is still going and going with the, with the help of the net zero energy building rating system, which fosters both on-site renewable energy and off-site renewable energy. But intangible benefits, Green buildings have particularly focused on health and safety benefits, which talks about enhanced occupant comfort, safety of the occupants. Uh, this could be a factory building where safety is upmost or an office building where both the things, comfort as well as safety is very important. Green buildings in general have uh, been closely connected with productivity and accessibility of occupants. So, the uh, uh, focus is paid towards uh, 
since because uh, we are talking about the occupant comfort, uh, we are indirectly we are talking about the productivity as well. Of course, environmental benefits uh, definitely are there related to green buildings. So over the years, what green buildings have done differently, uh, some of the things are highlighted over here. So green buildings in general uh, talk about the integrated design for a team effort. Usually when we talk about buildings in general, uh, during the different stages of construction and operation, the teams are different. They do not interact with each other. However, for the last decade or so, green buildings have fostered the relationship between, uh, let's say, the person who is constructing the building, the person who is designing the building, and the person who is operating the building. So if you put up a joint effort or an integrated design approach, it is easier to achieve a, a higher performance for a building. Green buildings have also spoken about a holistic approach. So it is not just about materials or indoor air quality or site sustainability. It is also about the, the uh, amalgamation of energy and water savings, materials, IAQ, site. So we have to look at it in a holistic manner. It is not just savings, let's say, so just for the energy or just for the water. Green buildings have adhered to standards such as NBC, which is National Building Code, Energy Conservation Building Code, IPM, VP, SMACNA, and others, and hence, have adhered to the best of the standards and are able to perform very good. Talking about the HVAC system and indoor air comfort, in general, uh, green buildings have been able to achieve a higher HVAC performance. One such example is when we sp speak about the square foot per TR, uh, which is now achieved at around 600 and even above. So 600 square foot per TR has become a norm now when we are talking about buildings. We have also spoken about uh, going for chillers with the highest COP. For an example, nowadays chillers of COP7 and above are available, and this is what is preferred. Many of the buildings have also adopted solar air conditioning. One such example is Turbo Energy in Chennai. We have spoken about passive cooling, Echo Mall in Dehradun. So all these have helped the buildings to achieve a higher performance than a conventional. Green buildings have also spoken about uh, introduction of new technologies and products into the building sector, such as waterless urinals were first introduced in a green building, root zone treatment system for the treatment of wastewater generated in a building, light pipes for a higher daylighting, widespread use of fly ash blocks, of course, because of the reuse. Uh, uh, materials, insulated walls, roof, and glazing, so uh, which is key focus of green buildings in terms of achieving energy performance. Low emitting materials, paints, sealants, and adhesives, etc. Green buildings have also focused on resource efficiency when we talk about reuse of used furniture. One such example is ITC Green Center, Low and Turbo Energy. Over the years, uh, green buildings have used simulation tools for both energy and lighting for optimizing the use of energy in these buildings. This can be used at both the levels, uh, even at a design level as well as, as operational. Going further to the green existing building rating system, which we are, which is the focus topic today. So the green existing building rating system came in 2013. We, till date, we have around 200 registered projects of around 64 million square feet, out of which around 108 projects have already certified and which are operational. We talk about the uh, existing building rating system. The main objective of the rating system was to facilitate building owners and facility managers in implementing green strategies, measure the impacts, and sustain the performance in the long run. This is a very important aspect. Sustaining the performance in the long run is what we, we focus on in a green building or an existing green building. This was first of its kind of rating system to address sustainability in an existing building. 
when we talk about the building types which are covered by the existing building rating system so it covers almost all non residential buildings offices it parks bpos shopping malls airports banks hotels police stations are in fact a new addition now we have recently certified a police station also uh, it was earlier applicable for hospitals and resorts also but over uh, in the last two years we have come out with two rating systems on green hospitals and green resorts which are now the key rating system for these two type of Now let's talk about a, a bit about what the existing building rating system is all about. So existing building rating, when we talk about as around four main modules, which is site and facility management, water efficiency, energy efficiency, health and comfort, and then there is the innovation and design. Each of these modules have got prerequisites. There are around seven prerequisites, and these are mandatory requirements which are important for achieving a green building certification. So without these, you will not be able to achieve the certification. Now, when we are talking about an existing building, there are various challenges which are there. Uh, so these buildings could be already green buildings. So if they are already a green building, let's suppose they have already been certified in new building category, they must have already done a lot of things to achieve the green status and for them achieving the existing building rating system certification would be fairly easy however it may not be the case with most of the buildings so most of the buildings when they come for green building certification they've got some or the other challenges few of them are highlighted over here so mostly we have seen that buildings in general have a poor waste management so they may be having uh, somebody who's taking care of the waste management, but it is not monitored. One such example is seen over here. Uh, very often we see that green buildings or, or existing buildings which come for green building certification have got a poor fresh air ventilation. They either will have will will not have a fresh air ventilation for most of the HVAC uh, or the conditioned area, or they may have the systems but they are not operating. Most of the buildings will also uh, be having, be using toxic housekeeping chemicals, which are not recommended. There are several other opportunities related to, or rather challenges related to existing building. For example, for an existing building, the orientation cannot be changed. So you cannot now benefit from the orientation when we are talking about where do you face uh, the building's facade. The envelope most often cannot be changed. It can be modified to a certain extent when we're talking about insulation. However, majorly you will not be able to demolish any one portion of the building and rebuild. The building can have inefficient systems and equipments. You may have metering at a building level, but may not have the sub metering. And most of them all, you may not be having monitoring even if you are having sub metering. Metering can be uh, both for energy as well as water. Talking about this, what are the opportunities which lies for an existing building for going green? So first and foremost is fostering good waste management practices. This is one very important thing because waste management is a big problem in India. And if we do not segregate the waste, if we do not treat the waste, then it becomes a problem and in the long run will be a very big problem point. The opportunities for uh, reducing water consumption of the building, of course, water being uh, one of the uh, very important and precious commodities right now. And since the amount of water uh, is reducing because of the reduced uh, uh, water levels, underground water levels and uh, changes in the climate, so because of which uh, the availability of water is reduced and hence uh, reduction in water consumption is a very important aspect. Energy consumption, of course, is a very important aspect. There are opportunities in terms of fresh air ventilation. So quite often the buildings do not address the fresh air ventilation and this can be addressed uh, during the green building certification. 
We also talk about enhanced indoor air quality when we are talking about the pollutants, when we are talking about uh, the CO2 monitoring and others. Uh, one very important aspect which we have seen in during audits is uh, giving facilities for differently abled. Uh, quite often, many of the buildings do not uh, adhere to uh, a universal design for differently abled. But during the certification process, we have seen buildings transform their buildings to be uh, to facilitate movement of differently abled for the for so that they also would be able to come here and talk. Now let's talk about what is the approach for creating an existing building. So when we talk about greening an existing building, there can be three types of measures. They could be simple measures whose ROI should be, would be less than one year. Midterm measures, ROI less than uh, equal to one to two years. Or long-term measures, which will be three and above number of years. Short-term measures might include insulation of roof garden, reduction in outdoor lighting power density. These are very uh, immediate uh, giving results uh, measures. Replacement of inefficient water fixtures. It is something that you can do immediately without much of a cost. Uh, talking about rainwater housing, which is a very important aspect of a green building. CO2 monitoring could be implemented in most of the buildings. And the use of eco-friendly housekeeping chemicals. We have seen most in most cases when a, when a, green, when a, when a building comes for green building certification, they are not using housekeeping chemicals which are eco-friendly. Rather, they are having an idea that whatever chemicals we are using are eco-friendly or biodegradable, but they may not be. It may not be the case. We also talk about mid-terms and long-term measures. So, mid-term and long-term measures might include rooftop solar photovoltaics for meeting the part of the energy consumption of the building, installing wastewater treatment system for uh, recycling the uh, previous treatment, sewage all over the building, reuse of treated water. Of course, if you are having an on-site uh, treatment plant, water treatment plant, you can always use that water for the landscaping requirement, flushing, etc. Of course, flushing has got a challenge. If you do not have a dual plumbing in your building, then probably that is a big challenge for the building for implementation. We also talk about offsite renewable energy. You can always go for offsite renewable energy. You can go for open access, or you can also go for a purchase of renewable energy certificates. Uh, regarding renewable energy certificates, a, a very important aspect is that uh, we, we talk about RECs to be bought inside of India and not outside of India. Long term measures would also include replacement of inefficient equipment which would include chillers, EHUs, fans, water pumps, lighting system, etc. So we have uh, discussed what are the measures or, uh, in terms of short term, mid term and long term. Now let's go into individual categories or, or areas where which, which may be used for greening an existing building and how, how it helps in greening. It. So one of the very important aspect is waste management. So as you know that waste, uh, a normal commercial building on an average generates around 0.12 to 0.6 kg waste per capita per day. There's a huge amount of waste which is coming in and we need to address the, the idea of uh, waste management through green buildings. We are very happy to say that most of the green buildings, in fact, all the green buildings are able to adhere to the sustainable practices related to waste management. Many of the buildings have reduced their waste or they have engaged uh, an agency which is recycling the waste for them. However, when we talk about uh, waste management, one very important aspect is uh, the segregation and source. So uh, we say that if you are segregating the waste at source, 80 of 80 percent of the problem is solved then and there. So then you can take the dry waste separate. You can take the waste it will separate and treat them accordingly. However, if you if it is collected 
in, in in one bin let's suppose you dry weight waste and waste waste is in one one bin it is very difficult to segregate and hence treating is very difficult you also seen waste management uh, some, some of the examples over here is uh, uh, how you can use the waste in your own building so this is one such example but they made uh, you know so they have reused and recycled the waste for this purpose. Here we can see one such example where waste is being segregated in different areas. So sheds have been made for different type of waste. So these could be paper, metal, uh, leaves, anything that is coming out of the building can be segregated and then separately recycled or reused. So it is very important for buildings to have color coded beans so that the segregation can happen. And also a common waste collection area where the segregated waste can be put and uh, these can be taken by the recyclers or they can be taken for uh, you reuse in the building if possible. Uh, you can see one such example over here is uh, the dry leaves is collected and they are shredded and then ultimately used in an organic waste a converter which ultimately converts into manure and is used in landscaping so through this you, you can see that you are able to use organic manure in your own building and hence reduce any such of any such fertilizer which may be required for landscaping another example is using the kitchen waste for producing biogas which can ultimately be reused in a decanting this is one unique Example that we have seen in the form of a bottle crusher, uh, which can be deployed mostly in public buildings where uh, a lot of plastic bottles are being re reused. And uh, here uh, the bottles are shredded and they are sent for recycling. Another big aspect of a green building is mitigation of heat island effect. So before talking about the mitigation of heat island effect, we would first like to know what heat island effect is. So as you can see over here in this example, the temperature of a rural area or a suburban residential area is different than when we talk about you know, the city area. So usually uh, there is a rise in temperature during the afternoon. And all this is happening because of the concrete jungle that is there in the cities. The concrete jungle, because, because there are less number of trees, what happens? The heat gets accumulated in these buildings and these affect the local temperature because the, temp the, the air which is coming in contact with these buildings, the temperature rises and ultimately the local temperature would increase substantially. To the tune of around 5 to 8 degrees centigrade, as we can see over here. What happens because of this? Because of the heat island effect, you will have higher temperatures, higher air temperature outside, and because of which you will have to keep your air conditioning running for a higher amount of time. The air conditioning would run more because, because of this effect, and ultimately you will have to spend a lot of energy for cooling your environment. Or cooling your building. This is an example of how heat island effect can be addressed in buildings. You can see this is an example of a roof garden which is there at Godraj Bhavan. So you can see the tiles which are there have a higher temperature, whereas the landscape have a low, has a lower temperature. So ultimately, what happens because of this, the heat, the cooling requirement for the building goes down. Heat island can be reduced by either of these methods. So when we are talking about roof, you can implement high SRI tile roof, you can implement vegetation, you can also implement China mosaic tiles. So all these measures help in reducing or mitigating the heat island effect and ultimately reduce the negative impact on the microclimate. When talking about non-roof structures, you can use grass pavers or grid pavers and shades. 
for reducing the heat ion effect in such areas. You can also reduce the heat iron effect by including more number of trees, shrub, and water bodies. Here is one example where uh, the Bombay House adopted one strategy for landscaping. Uh, so the reason that uh, this example is put over here is because uh, if you talk about uh, buildings in Mumbai, most of them do not have a outer boundary. The building itself is the boundary of boundary of the building and uh, hence uh, there was no landscaping in the building so while going for green building certification they had a requirement of having a minimum percentage of landscaping so instead of since they are not able to introduce a landscape in their own building so hence what they did is they're they're maintaining a nearby park and which is uh, located at madam madam kama street and hence they are meeting the requirement. So it is not just uh, the boundary of the building. You can always go beyond the boundary of the building and address the system. Some examples of landscaping you can see over here. So the water bodies as well as the trees and shrubs, they help in reducing the local micro. Another very important aspect is water conservation. So when we talk about water conservation, the first thing that we need to address is uh, water conservation through water efficient fixtures. You can always implement low flow fixtures, which can which can always be aerators or sensor based fixtures. In today's times, because of the COVID, it is always preferable to have a sensor based fixture so that you should not be able to, or you should not touch the water fixtures and hereby avoid contamination. This is something that probably would uh, see increased usage in all the buildings. We also talk about low flow fixtures in, uh, in the form of water closets or waterless urinals. So these can also be sensor, sensor based urinals or can also be waterless urinals. When talking about the water, uh, the Efficient fixtures, water efficient fixtures. These are some of the uh, flow rates which can be referred for meeting the requirement. So, water closets for full flush, they should have six liter per flush, per, and uh, for half flush, they should have three liter per flush. Urinals may have a uh, consumption of four liters per flush. So, water little liter. Waterless urinals would help in saving around 67% of uh, the water consumption in one building, and this is one of the examples for that building. When talking about water consumption reduction, a very important aspect is uh, implementation of efficient irrigation system through drip irrigation, central shut off walls, and installation of water meters for monitoring of the water usage. A very important aspect of uh, water consumption or water uh, reduction in water consumption is talking about water metering. Because if you if you do not meter the consumption of the water, you will not be able to say whether my consumption is 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 good or bad. And you should always have a benchmark level for meeting the requirement. So, for an example, for an, for a office building, you can have uh, water consumption per person per day could be around 45 liters. So this can become a benchmark for you if you are metering in your building and if you're monitoring it, you can always compare. Another big example is rainwater harvesting. Most of the buildings that we have visited have some or the other form of rainwater harvesting, either they are uh, storing or either they are percolating the water. So more or less these are addressed. However, there are buildings which do not have rainwater harvesting in, in them, and this needs to be addressed. So you can have two strategies for rainwater harvesting. Either you can collect the rainwater 
or you can percolate the rainwater to the ground. If you're collecting the rainwater, you can store it or you can in the form of a tank or you can have a collection pond. If you're storing the rainwater, then you can reuse either in your building uh, for let's suppose say a flushing requirement or even for uh, hand washing requirements. You can also have a percolation of rainwater to the ground through percolation pits and collecting too. This is one such example of uh, rainwater harvesting in a large building back to factory where they have uh, put rainwater harvesting pond or collection of rain. Another such example for one facility where they have implemented both rainwater storage as well as percolation. This is another example for Asia closures in Hyderabad, which is a platinum rated building. They have also implemented rainwater harvesting in the form of a pond. Let's talk about wastewater treatment and reuse. So, of course, now first you have spoken about uh, how should you reduce the water consumption in a building. Then we talk about how the wastewater generated has to be treated and reused in the building. So there can be two ways of uh, wastewater treatment. It could be a biological treatment that can be a phytoremediation plant or root zone sy treatment system, or it can be a mechanical treatment which can help in you know treating the water. And then either you can reuse into in the facility or you can uh, let it go into the nearest stream. Several ways. So, this is an example of uh, STP and ETP where the water is being reused on this particular site for uh, landscaping purpose. So, the treated wastewater can be used for landscaping, can be used for flushing, or it can also be used for cooling tower makeup water. Now let's talk about energy efficiency in existing buildings. So we are already aware of how, uh, what are the ways that energy efficiency can be addressed uh, in existing buildings. Some of the features that you can easily recognize. So this was the old method of uh, lighting, using lighting in a building. Now we have all shifted to LED lights. So it is, it is not a new thing. In fact, however, when we compare uh, to CFLs, then we can achieve almost around 50% of reduction in energy consumption for lighting. Exterior lighting uh, reduced reduction in outdoor LPD for garden, pathways, and facade, etc., should be achieved. A very important aspect for exterior lighting is talking about night sky pollution. So all the fixtures should be downward facing, and the facade lighting should be minimum. When you talk about ceiling fans, of course, BLDC fans are available nowadays. So they have they are 40 percent efficient in comparison to the old fans. Daylighting is an important aspect in a building. Uh, many buildings might be designed for enhanced daylighting or use of daylighting in a building. However, in case the daylighting is not very good, you can always deploy uh, light pipes or skylight in a building. Uh, one such example is on the left hand side. You can see a light pipe coming through the windows and redu reducing the use of artificial lighting in that building. Examples of daylight can be as such. Th these are uh, light pipes installed in one such facility, and you can see you cannot differentiate between an artificial light and, and a light pipe. So these can also be used for lighting in areas uh, such as basement. Uh, and uh, can, of course, that would require uh, some amount of uh, breaking uh, the building. However, it is not very difficult to implement. Now, when we talk about HVAC system, HVAC uses somewhere close to around 40 to 60 percent of the building energy consumption for a conditioned air conditioned building. And uh, it is very important to reuse the energy consumption related to air conditioning. So if supposedly the chiller 
which, which is being reused used in a building is more than 15 years old, then you should always think about retrofitting the chiller to, to bring in new technology and enhanced performance. Talking about energy efficiency, you should always use the for four star rated appliances. We, what we say is uh, it should at least be four star because uh, if you're going with three star, that would become two star or one star in the next two or three years because we continuously uh, assesses the performance of all these appliances. So B's star or equivalent labeling is available for air conditioning, refrigerators, projectors, LCD, and many more. So energy efficiency is also addressed through pumps and motors. Of course, you can always retrofit uh, the existing pumps and motors for, by going with IE3 motors and efficient pumps. These would reduce the consumption substantially. Another aspect is talking about uh, renewable energy. So it is always preferred in a building to go for a renewable energy if possible. Uh, many buildings might have limitations in terms of space. They do not have enough rooftop space. Uh, they also might have limitation in terms of implementation of RE, for example, in case of a heritage building where the facade or the roof is not allowed to change uh, by the government. Apart from that, most of the buildings have space for at least meeting uh, installation of uh, solar photovoltaics for at least meeting around two to five percent of the annual energy consumption of the building. So you can always go for uh, BIPVs, micro wind turbines, and solar wind hybrid. Also, this is one of the examples that we always give. We can always explore for solar wind hybrids for your building. A very good example of uh, how energy efficiency can be implemented. This is an example of how the building energy consumption has come down due to all the energy efficiency measures. So as you can see, uh, the annual energy consumption of the building was somewhere close to around 11,000 megawatt hour, which has come down to around 8,000 megawatt hour because of all the measures which have been implemented. Some of the measures, as you can see over here, uh, had less impact, for an example, the high albedo roof, which have around one to two percent of reduction. Uh, the exterior lighting might not affect much. However, when we talk about the uh, implementation of uh, LED lighting, you can see the LED retrofit have uh, reduced the uh, energy consumption significantly. Also, when we talk about retrofitting the chillers, it has come down significantly. So these are the measures, some of the measures, in fact, for a building which can be you know, taken up for reducing the energy consumption of the building. Green buildings in general have used energy simulation as a tool to improve their efficiency. So quite often we talk about uh, energy simulation in new buildings where we are uh, first comparing the energy consumption with, uh, let's suppose say, uh, uh, the, the codes like uh, the ASHRAE or uh, energy conservation building code, uh, where you have to comply with these uh, codes. However, this can also be used for an existing building. Now, it's very important in an existing building that you talk about uh, calibration of your model as well, because if you are having a data of last one year energy consumption, you can always calibrate your building energy model to that. When you are calibrating the building energy model, then you can take the benefit of the building model to also decide upon what measures to adopt. For an example, here we have uh, talked about calibrated simulation where the performance comparison was done with the uh, baseline building and energy efficiency measures were identified and retrofitted accordingly. So you can always see which measures would give you the most savings and then you can implement those savings into your building. So these tools are, or the energy simulation tools are very good tool for existing buildings also. And I think most, if if people are able to uh, do energy simulation in a building, that is the most preferred method. Last but not least, we should always talk about energy metering and management. So we encourage some metering and continuous monitoring. 
Some mentoring is very important because you would a be able to understand what is the energy mix of the building, how much is the HVAC consuming, uh, HVAC consuming the energy, how much uh, lighting consumption is there, and others. So compliance could be uh, when we talk about energy metering and management, you can always go for energy metering. We can always talk about retrofitting the building system to uh, engage building management system also. So this is something that can also be spoken about for retrofitting in an existing building. So these are the areas where you should talk about some metering. It could be uh, common air lighting, exterior air lighting, water pumping, groundwater pumping, treated wastewater pumping. Should also be implemented for renewable energy generation power backup systems, elevators, escalators, or it may be for BTU meter for chill water consumption also. So all these help you in identifying areas where the energy consumption is over and above uh, the baseline and where action need to be taken for reducing the energy consumption. Of it. So this is a very important aspect of a green building. Metering and monitoring is something that should be done in any building, whether a green building or Talk about one such case study for Bombay House, which is a Tata headquarters in Mumbai. Uh, we are quite often we talk about this building as a, a case study because uh, this is something uh, very important to know that this is a heritage grade two structure, and many of the things are not possible over here. For example, implementation of an STP, uh, talking about on-site renewable energy, which is not possible. Even after all these challenges, Bombay House is able to achieve gold status and they are able to reduce their energy consumption over a period of year and reduce their EPI and hence improve their energy performance. So you can see uh, their energy performance is depicted over here from the year 2010 to 2017. They had a target of 90 kilowatt hour per square meter per year and they have already achieved it. Some of the strategies which were implemented at Bombay House. So you can see over here in this particular picture, they have uh, spoken about solar PV systems. They have spoken about dual flush toilets, VFDs in, and BMS systems, high efficiency chillers, these targeted appliances, energy efficient lightings, as well as rainwater harvesting. Uh, a very important aspect of an of a green building is uh, the fresh air ventilation for the air conditioning uh, areas. So this is a very important aspect, and they should all buildings, all green buildings, adhere to the minimum requirement of fresh air ventilation. So these are the retrofit measures which were taken at Bombay House, which resulted in reduction of uh, five lakh kilowatt hour of energy and CO2 savings of 297. Let's talk about renewable energy. So renewable energy we've already spoken about is one way to make your building more sustainable and move towards net zero in terms of energy. So the two modes of uh, renewable energy implementation in a building, you can go for on-site renewable energy or you can go for if you're going for an offsite renewable energy, it is very important that you should have a power purchase agreement for the building uh, in order to bring that energy or account that energy for that particular project. Many a times uh, projects have spoken about uh, the solar PV, which is implemented in any other projects to be accounted for this project, which is not possible for green building as that energy is not accounted for this project that is something which is either going to the grid or it is being accounted for the project for the original project which where it is implemented. In 2018, we came out with the IGBC net zero energy building rating system. And after that, we also put efforts for uh, converting our own building, which is the Indian Green Building Council's headquarter, the GBC headquarters. It has also been retrofitted to achieve the net zero energy platinum status in 2019. So 
So some of the measures we have highlighted over here, which have helped us in achieving the net zero status. So we went for the retrofitting of uh, energy efficient chillers. So this is water cooled chillers, which has been implemented and uh, which is uh, around 43 uh, TR with a kilowatt TR of 0.64. So this is a very important aspect. So the kilowatt TR was very less as compared to the earlier system, which has helped us in reducing the uh, energy users related to HVAC system. Over the year, we have also retrofitted our existing fixtures with lighting fixtures with LED fixtures. So earlier around 72 watt was utilized by one fixture. Now around 38 watt is used by one fixture. Uh, since these are LED uh, lighting, the number of fixtures have also come down significantly. So as you can see, around 211 fixtures were used earlier. Now less than 100 fixtures are being used in the building. So which means not just the power uh, wise you are able to say, save, but since the overall number of has come down, the over wattage has come down significantly. This would reduce the lighting load significantly. That being said, the GBC already uh, uses Skylight and has got very good daylighting in, in most of its area. So the usage of artificial lighting itself is very less most of the time of the year. GBC also has a real time monitoring of uh, the HVAC system. Uh, you can control the fresh air ventilation. You can also see, see the CO2 levels and change the uh, operation mode accordingly. This is a snapshot of the HU and the wind tower the ETC area. A very important aspect uh, which has helped us in achieving the net zero status is the 138 kilowatt solar PV system which was installed in 2019. Uh, so this is basically a bifacial solar PV system which has been implemented which generates uh, Power from both the side of the. So ideally, you will see uh, solar PVs generating only from the front side or the topmost side. However, this system generates from both the sides. So this was a demonstration project for establishing net zero energy in our building with a payback of somewhere around close to 6.4 months. So this was uh, given to us by PPAM Solcraft of and manufacture the panels. Some of the unique features of bifacial solar PV modules is uh, part of it is transparent and frameless. Backside of the module generates around 90% of what is there in the front side. As you can see over here, we have spoken about 24%, 15%, 22, and 57. These are ways in which the solar modules were uh, implemented. As you can see, the last one, the 57% is when the solar balance panels are elevated at a height of around 1.5 meters, and because of which uh, the reflection is there from the roof, and hence the backside of the panel also generates significantly. This is one such example where we are utilizing high SRI paint for reflection of solar, and hence increasing the yield of the So this allows the building to be able to achieve uh, net zero status over a period of one. We have spoken about all the important aspects where we talk about energy, water. Uh, a very important aspect of an existing building is also eco-friendly computing practices. We talk about the use of low emitting vehicles uh, where uh, we increase the use of non-fossil fuel vehicles, thereby reducing negative impacts resulting from fossil fuel based automobiles. We have seen a very huge change in this particular sector. And now since the regulations have also started coming in, people are talking more in terms of uh, the implementation of charging points, both in uh, public areas as well as in buildings such that they can uh, the use of electric vehicles can be used, increased significantly. One such example you can see over here in one of the building, uh, they've installed the fast chargers, which, is, which are the industrial chargers, 
which can use for, be used for charging these vehicles. Another important aspect for a green building is design for differently able. Uh, now, when we talk about uh, differently able design, four things, four major things comes into mind. One is uh, talking about the restrooms in terms of usage, talking about accessibility in terms of lifts, in terms of ramps, and talking about how you can assess uh, the floor level by uh, maintaining a even floor for for the for the project. Now, many aspects cannot be changed. It is already imbibed in a existing building. However, you can always talk about uh, a preferred card park space for uh, uh, different different labels so that he is able to he or she is able to assess the entrance of the building uh, through this parking. We always talk about uh, restrooms. We talk about non slippery ramps. Uh, talks about, we talk about braille and audio assistant and lifts. Further, let's talk about the indoor environment quality and occupant well-being. This is one area which uh, is is very important for green buildings. And over the years, uh, green buildings have focused a lot in improving the uh, indoor environment quality or the indoor air quality, which you talk about, uh, and the occupant's well-being. So all the green buildings, they provide better ventilation to ensure good indoor environment. For air conditioning building, or air conditioning building, fresh air uh, uh, through a mechanical system is very important and they should be implemented. For an unconditioned building, at least uh, the opening should be provided, which is so that the ratio of opening to the carpet area is at least 4%. So all the build windows, and openings would, would should be at least 4% of the carpet area so that you can open these structures in the time of need. Existing buildings focus on a uh, few important aspects of air quality. We talk about tobacco, tobacco smoke control. So most of the buildings, in fact, all the buildings are, uh, they do not use, uh, they, they, they have banned smoking in, in, in these campuses. All existing buildings which have been rated till date are adhering to the fresh air ventilation requirements. Now, when you talk about fresh air ventilation, uh, it is important to understand that many green buildings may already have a fresh air ventilation system. In such a case, you need to understand whether the building is or the fresh air ventilation requirement is, is meeting the, the codes or not. So you can always refer to the existing building rating system an extra two where you can calculate the fresh air requirement for each and every space and then compare what is the amount of fresh air ventilation which is available in these spaces. So after comparison, you can say whether your space or your building as a total is meeting the requirement of fresh air ventilation or not. The green building, uh, green existing building rating system doesn't specifically talk about monitoring of uh, parameters like PM10, 2.5, but this is where we are. Uh, talking about going towards in the next version when we're talking about monitoring of indoor air quality parameters also. However, uh, we should also highlight that PM10 2.5 TVOC are something that you should always monitor. CO2 monitoring is something that is uh, that is uh, there in the existing building rating system and which is uh, which is always preferred. Now. Now, in an existing building, you, this is one of the area which is very easily implemented. So most of the buildings when we first visit do not know what uh, a green housekeeping chemical is. But over uh, in a very short period of time, they are able to implement the, these chemicals because they are readily available in the market. And uh, two such examples are given over here. These are certified by uh, Green Pro, Green Pro certification. Existing building also talks about enhanced occupational health for, for the occupants. One such uh, report was published by us where we have spoken about uh, uh, the occupants well being through the various parameters and how green buildings in general have uh, helped in achieving all these. So many such those parameters were thermal comfort, acoustic comfort, visual comfort, ergonomics, 
greenery, health and hygiene, social inclusiveness and awareness, fitness and green transit. We have received uh, many uh, surveys from all the certified buildings and one such example is displayed over here where uh, people say that green buildings allow to facilitate both daylighting and glare control for 89% of the occupants. So the 89% of the occupants said they are very comfortable with the lighting uh, availability in that particular building, that certified building. Further, let's talk about uh, green products. So, uh, when uh, people go for uh, green building certification, they always talk about what products to be used for uh, greening of their buildings. One very important aspect is when we talk about green housekeeping chemicals. So, uh, green products, uh, there, there are several products which have been certified as green housekeeping chemicals, and uh, these are available on Green Pearl's website. Uh, Let's talk about uh, uh, how Green Pro certification works. So Green Pro certification talks about the life cycle analysis of, of these products from cradle to grave. And uh, so these are following international standards and protocols for testing and evaluation. So till date around 1500 uh, products have been certified as green uh, for more than 110 companies. This is a suggestive list of all the companies which have achieved Green Pro certification. Green Pro is also recognized by the global GEN network, which is global equilibrium network, and is also recognized by the UNEP, which is United Nations Environment. Green Pro in general is employed as a tool to identify the green products, materials, and technologies. In fact, uh, you can easily go to the website of Green Products, which is greenpro.com, where all these products have been listed and uh, in several categories along with their technical manuals. A very important aspect uh, why we are talking about Green Pro over here is uh, in the last few years, we have seen increased use of green products in all these pro all, all the buildings which are going for certification. Many such products uh, can be used by buildings which are going for either a new building rating system or existing building. In new building, of course, you can talk about construction materials also. Uh, where you can talk about building facade, envelope, building interiors and technologies, etc. For an existing building, of course, the scope may be limited to just paints, coatings and chemicals, uh, building interiors and few technologies like IEQ solution, rainwater harvesting, solar photovoltaics and others. Till date, uh, when we talk about uh, Green Pro, almost around 80% of the passive building products by cost is covered by Green Pro, which is a very big achievement in itself. Let's talk about uh, certification process. Uh, so till now, uh, we have covered almost all aspects of uh, existing building uh, rating system as and all the measures that can be taken up by uh, any building for greening their facility. Now let's talk about what all you can do and how to proceed for the certification. So if when we talk about the existing building certification process, the primary is registration. Of course, the registration can be done uh, online or offline. Uh, you can always contact uh, always go to IGBC.in and contact us. Once the uh, documentation is submitted to IGBC for review, we take somewhere around close to 30 days for releasing the preliminary review. Uh, after which, uh, you may go back and address all the technical uh, advices. And once you come back with the final review, we again take around 30 days to re release the final review. So, in total, uh, at least two months is taken for the certification, but what we say at least around three three months should be uh, kept for certification process. So once we release the final score by by releasing the final review, once you accept us, we award you as with the Placan certificate. Uh, 
showcasing that you have achieved certification with the levels. Now to to few of you which who would be interested in documentation also, I mean you can always go for uh, consultant in case uh, you are uh, you are sort of not able to do the documentation. You can contact us. We can give you the list of the consultants who are who can do the documentation for you and get the building certified. In any case, uh, documentation requirements are key to, under, to be understood by all the owners or any building which is going for certification, such that you can help the consultants also in achieving the certification because you would be providing the feedback or all the documents for them to compile. In any case, uh, a brief about the documentation is given over here. So there are four main components to the documentation or existing building rating. One is the existing building template, uh, which is fairly available when the, the moment a project registers, we send the EV templates to, to you. Uh, the EV template is a very good tool because it has all the calculations and the requirements that is there in the green building certification for existing building. Uh, and it gives you a summary of what all points you can go for. Uh, another important component uh, of documentation is the credit narrative. So for an example, if you are uh, applying for uh, water conservation credit, uh, where we are talking about conservation through implementation of efficient water fixtures. So there you need to give you give us uh, the information about what uh, is the uh, FT for the building? What is the number of occupants? Uh, what are the systems which are there? And uh, how uh, you are reducing the water consumption of the building? So all this uh, requires a small narrative. In fact, almost all credits would require some or the other background for us to other I mean, evaluate. You can also give calculation sheets. Of course. Uh, most of the calculations are, are part of EV template and they can be used for showing the calculation in terms of savings, in terms of how much uh, you are able to achieve in terms of credits. The last but not least is are the supporting documents. In fact, um, at times these play a major role because uh, they would support uh, the the way the, the thing that uh, in terms of uh, implementation of measures, what measures you have implemented, they would support the cost. These could be in the form of invoices, uh, a policy document could be a contract, or could be simply in terms of photographs of implemented measures. Uh, I have given you a short snapshot of the EB template. I don't know whether uh, it is visible. Uh, however, you can see over here, uh, we can see water efficient fixtures, uh, which, is, which is displayed over here. This is the calculation for uh, the base case and the proposed case in case of water consumption of the building. So you can easily calculate it over here. You don't need to uh, put a different calculator or you don't have to go anywhere else. All these calculations are readily available. Uh, this is an example of uh, rainwater harvesting where you can see based on the past data, uh, you can always calculate the, uh, the amount of uh, rainwater harvesting that can be done. So for rainwater harvesting, as we, as we know, one day rainfall is what you have to capture in a building. So that is can be calculated over here. Another very important aspect is the fresh air ventilation. So fresh air ventilation, uh, the important aspect is to understand how much is the amount of fresh air required in a building. And the calculation sheet is also available in the EV template, which can be used for knowing what is the amount of fresh air ventilation based on the area and based on the people which are there in the building and or the space or the particular space that we are talking about. And then you can see whether that particular space is meeting the requirement. So these are the four major areas which constitute the IGBC, uh, which constitute the documentation for certification. Um, last but not least, IGBC also promotes uh, the IGBC accredited professional examination, uh, which recognizes the holistic understanding of green building concepts 
uh, and also meets the demand for qualified IGBC professionals. So in green building certification, in fact, uh, we promote the IGBC examination so that anybody who is uh, part of the project would benefit from it. To sum up, uh, there are excellent opportunities available for uh, the existing building to improve the energy efficiency, water savings, indoor environment quality, and gain a green image. And we at IGBC would always be glad to support anybody who wishes to certify the projects in all their aspects. Uh, last uh, but not least, uh, very recently, since we have been talking about uh, COVID-19 and uh, very soon, uh, in fact, in many areas, the lockdown has been lifted. IGBC has also come out with a guideline for combating COVID-19 for green buildings. So these will be fairly available on our website. So, yes. so we say uh, at IGBC, uh, you can live, learn, work, shop, travel, uh, so there all in almost all the areas you can always go for green. Thank you. Over to Mr. Puneet. Thank you, Himanshu. Uh, it was a really interesting and interesting session. A very short and uh, crisp. You have uh, uh, explained many of the things. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the parchments, which, is being, which has been crossed, say, uh, say approximately 200, uh, so they have also been thinking that this is a very value added uh, things. Why I am been very sure that uh, uh, there is a value addition to the session because the number of questions and the quality of questions what I'm getting here uh, is, uh, I'm sorry, but I am have to pose a serious challenges uh, to you and I know that uh, you would hit all of them. So thank you very much. Uh, you have been the wonderful audience uh, on the other side and uh, now we would be taking care of uh, the question and answers which has been uh, uh, asked till now. I'm having an uh, before starting the the question and answer. I would request uh, you to kindly pose your questions and queries in the Q and A chat box uh, so that we can take it appropriately. So Himanshu, there is uh, uh, there are questions which has been related to uh, the indoor environment quality, there have been questions related to the water management and efficiency, the energy efficiency, and also some queries related to the renewable energy segment. So I'm just taking uh, one by one uh, to you. Uh, so based on these actions uh, we have discussed, the very first one is about uh, the site selection and the planning of site management. So Renuka uh, has asked uh, this uh, question that uh, can we use the high SRI paint, uh, the solar reflective index is high, on for non-roof areas like driveways to show compliance for the urban heat island effect which is for the non-roof. Yes, you can always use uh, high reflective paint in, in, in non-roof areas. Of course, but uh, you have to talk about uh, the SRI values uh, less than 68 uh, because uh, in such areas where you are walking or uh, where a reflection is possible, uh, there you will have a glare, a lot of glare. So in non-roof areas, you have to uh, very you use it restrictively and uh, you know in a manner that it does not uh, have glare. Thanks, Imanshu. That was really interesting. But just adding to 
this uh, there is another uh, uh, linking quotient which says that to evaluate the heat island effect uh, do we need uh, the simulation and if yes then uh, what simulation softwares are available which can be used and uh, accepted by igbc uh, purit uh, a very important aspect with respect to heat island effect is uh, that we are talking about uh, uh, the microclimate of course uh, when we talk about microclimate it may not directly affect the energy usage of the building for an example if you talk about uh, the roof uh, sri value the contribution in terms of energy usage would be energy reduction due to high sri might be somewhere close to around 1 to 2% and or in fact even less than 1% uh, so it is it is very difficult to to account uh, the high sri uh, effect uh, through energy simulation and uh, in most cases you will not be able to uh, benefit from it so uh, it is not recommended uh, to use any uh, simulation tools for uh, you know you know accounting the high sri effect uh, i mean you do not need that um, so uh, related to this uh, having another causing uh, posing a question on the simulation software uh, says that uh, uh, what would be the best simulation software you think for daylight and energy simulation studies now is there anything available for the wind analysis as well of course there are several question. tools uh, several tools which are available uh, design builder is one of them equest is one of the free ones which we which people use of course equest is very much limited to energy of course you cannot uh, do anything else over there for daylighting uh, people often use dialux as one of the tools uh, which which is preferred uh the other tools also available for daylighting in fact i can collaborate i, I can collate a, a list of uh, such tools and also circulate among other participants uh, sound interesting and the same things we may also share with uh, all of our uh, participants uh, to have a more uh, detailed idea about the simulation softwares and uh, there are also if you take trainings which is also available to make you aware and train on the simulation softwares so we may also like to share those details uh, uh, with you now sure, sure. Uh, when we when we talk about the uh, the energy and energy simulations that brings me uh, to uh, uh, mr uh, shivarasu from coimbatore is been asking uh, that what is the lpd the lighting power density for existing and green buildings as per the standard or i may say which standard we have been uh, looking at and uh, do we have any uh, standards to consider the uh, the exterior lpd as well as the uh, interior lpd purit uh, i think uh, the best uh, document for for referring uh, for both interior as well as the exterior lpd is the energy conservation building code of india there are two versions which are available of course uh, ecbc 2017 is what was followed up till now now uh, the new version ecbc 2017 energy conservation building code 2017 is available where both these areas are addressed so both interior lighting as well as exterior lighting is addressed when we talk about interior lighting in fact uh, there are two methods which are available for use of of these uh, of anybody who is using it one is the uh, building uh, area method where you talk about based on the typology of the building like suppose say an office building the uh, the wattage would be light lighting power density would be described or the values given you can also go for uh, individual area lpd level or the space uh, Uh, LPD level where we talk about uh, uh, different LPDs for different areas. For example, a parking would have a different uh, LPD level. Uh, you know, the office areas would have different LPD level, LPD levels, and so on. So ECBC Energy Conservation Building Code is one of the uh, very good document for office buildings in general. Uh, the LPD level of uh, less than one uh, watt per square foot or around ten uh, uh, watt per square meter. is what is recommended in in the terms of a building area 
Oh, fine. Uh, that's uh, great information, uh, Manshu. Uh, now, with this, uh, we are already talking about the energy simulation. So, Rajiv is willing to check uh, that uh, uh, they are given to understand that the HVAC system, uh, the VRV system is more energy efficient than the chiller based air conditioning systems. Uh, your thoughts, please. Uh, of course, when we talk about VRV systems, uh, VRV systems are very efficient. However, we will have to talk about the size of the building. In case for large size of a building, it is always uh, recommended to have a chiller based system because those are the most efficient. And, uh, just a minute. Please. However, a VRV system may not be possible for a very large scale building. Uh, these are efficient uh, for medium scale costs, small to medium scale building. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, there is. Much may I? Yes. Yes. Of course. Please proceed. I hope that I have. Uh, I'm able to answer uh, the previous uh, question. Of course, this can be elaborated further while talking about different uh, uh, sizes of the building and functionality of the building also. So that is something uh, very key during deciding what type of systems to, to use. Mm, OK, fine. Uh, so coming back to the uh, to the energy part, and it is uh, looks like an energy question, but ultimately turns into the uh, the indoor air quality questions. Now, uh, it is that uh, someone he hasn't quoted his uh, name. But they said that uh, we are having the split air conditioner in our building projects for air conditioning purposes. Would it be considered for uh, compliance to the fresh air requirement via multiple leakages? Uh, this is uh, in fact a very interesting question and uh, uh, we have seen that many of the buildings uh, which are small scale buildings uh, which are using uh, uh, unitary air conditioner for most of their spaces. Uh, they pose a lot of challenge for green building certification uh, because they don't have a centralized uh, air conditioning system. They do not have a fresh air ventilation system. They don't have a dedicated outdoor air system. So when they come for certification, it becomes a challenge for us because green building certification has got uh, fresh air ventilation as a mandatory requirement. So you need to address that. Uh, there's some ways in which uh, uh, you know, projects deal with it. Many projects would uh, go for installation of a fresh air ventilation system if that is possible in the building. If that is not possible due to uh, structural uh, integrity uh, related problems or problems with availability of the space or uh, any such constraint, people usually go for uh, implementation of an exhaust system. Uh, we have also seen a uh, few innovative systems where uh, these inline fans are able to pump in fresh air from the outside as well as exhaust. So they work on a cycle. For an example, they work for 10 minutes as a exhaust fan and 10 minutes as a uh, you know inlet fan. So that would uh, help the the particular space in you know having some amount of fresh air coming from outside. If you talk about just uh, the uh, uh, you know meeting the refresher requirement through uh, leakages. Uh, there is no particular methodology available right now to account for that, uh, at least not, not in the code right away, but uh, we would definitely discuss that and how to address that. Uh, we have uh, talked about uh, this in our another uh, rating system which we, are, which we are bringing in for small scale buildings, but this is a big challenge. So that would be available very soon. Uh, and I think uh, very similar to this, uh, 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 Mr. Rajiv has posing uh, questions about uh, the evaluation of uh, power stations and uh, what would be the new factor you may like to consider. Uh, if you allow me, uh, Himanshu, I'd like to answer these uh, questions in continuation to the previous what you have mentioned, that uh, the small uh, service buildings uh, uh, guidelines, which is on the verge of uh, finalizing. So once it has been finalized, Mr. Rajiv, we will be sharing with you uh, and the participants uh, where the 
the criteria would be specific to the small uh, size uh, service buildings and uh, the police stations we are considering in the same uh, rating system uh, coming back to the uh, the indoor air quality and the ventilation uh, parameters uh, uh, mr shivarasu has been asking that uh, uh, is there any regulatory requirement for periodic monitoring uh, uh, in terms of uh, water in terms of uh, energy or iaq audit and if yes then uh, which authority will do it or is it submitted to any panel in terms of uh, when we talk about the seaway statement we are uh, supposed to adhere to the cpcp requirements uh, however there is no such requirement uh, which uh, commercial buildings have to report in terms of window environment quality uh, however it's very important to monitor for your own benefit so the indoor environment quality uh, uh, the parameters such as co2 and uh, uh, the voc levels and others uh, can can be monitored so the most important factor is co2 which we say that has to be monitored in a green building through the fresh air ventilation we are trying to address that so okay. uh, this these i i hope that i am able to co cover uh, the entire plethora uh, that he was talking about so for uh, seaway treatment yes you are uh, you are supposed to test the quality of water and it has to be reported uh however for uh, uh, energy and for indoor environment quality there is no such requirement at that time oh, fine thanks uh, himanshu uh, similar to this uh, mr abhik is willing to know uh, that uh, whether igbc accept smart lighting solution as an efficient tool to address the minimizing the lighting power consumption uh See, smart lighting can. Uh, I mean, can, can you repeat what it? What the? What is the keyword? Smart lighting solutions. Uh, okay, so I'll uh, request uh, uh, Mr. Avik to kindly uh, share the details uh, in the chat box or can personal message. In Any the meantime, we'll I will. Uh, I'll talk about smart uh, lighting solutions. Uh, very. Uh, I mean. Uh, you have seen uh, increased usage in terms of iot in terms of home automation and all so yes smart lighting solutions are, are promoted by us in fact we we do accept in uh, the rating system also uh, whereas when we talk about the rating system it particularly talks about how you are reducing your energy consumption it could be the uses of smart automation through occupancy control through uh, home automation and many other things the key aspect is reduction reduction in energy consumption through whatever means to in 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 a nutshell yes uh, smart home automation or uh, in uh, smart automation in any buildings not just home automation in in commercial buildings in industrial buildings of course that is promoted yeah. okay fine uh, so uh, there is another uh, query i'm just uh, Uh, taking a little bit uh, uh, on the other modules as well and then we'll come back to the energy because there are many questions on the energy segments and uh, so it's obvious importance uh, i'm now uh, coming to some rain water harvesting uh, uh, challenges what the projects generally faces the one is uh, uh, a notion and this question is not by any of the participants but by myself that uh, there have been many projects uh, which is having the rainwater harvesting systems they have been collecting the roof water as well as the uh, non roof water rain water and then having a pit the projects are under the impression that because they are covering the entire roof and a non roof they should be considered as a 100% uh, uh, rainwater harvesting uh, capacity uh, criteria and then uh, should be getting the maximum points uh, so himanshu i would like you to uh, give some emphasis on uh, the uh, the right things because sometimes it has been seen that despite collecting all uh, the roof water and non roof water the size of the pit is so small it couldn't achieve even 25% of the requirement uh, would you like to elaborate himanshu for me 
and the audience. Absolutely, Preet. So uh, I think we we have seen this in many projects, and uh, uh, the the very important aspect over here is many of the projects have uh, not taken into into consideration what is the one day rainfall which is available to them. So what IGBC rating talks about is ideally we say at least one day peak rainfall should be captured by the project. Now this rainfall which is uh, being captured can be captured from the roof area as well as non roof. Area. So number one, uh, the first requirement is to calculation of what is the available amount of water based on the last five year uh, rainfall data with you. So let's suppose say you have somewhere close to around uh, 300 uh, cubic meter of rainfall which is available. Now uh, from this 300 cubic meter, if supposedly you are able to store around 200 cubic meter and percolate another 100 cubic meter, that would suffice the requirement of rainwater harvesting. Let's suppose say we are talking about 100% rainwater harvesting. So this is how we approach for rainwater harvesting requirement for existing building rating. So first and foremost, first is calculation of what is the amount of rainwater available with us uh, in terms of one day rainfall, then calculation of in terms of what is the amount of water that you are feeding into the ground or storing and that then we should see what percentage we are. Feeding. So I hope that uh, uh, I've answered it. Uh, a very good tool for this uh, is uh, our own uh, template that we were talking about, the EV template, where the calculation methodology is given clearly and uh, the percolation, uh, the uh, coefficients for different type of uh, surfaces, for an example, for roof, uh, which is concrete, the runoff coefficient would be 0.95. Uh, for uh, areas where there is soil, the runoff coefficient would be 0.05. So, so hence the availability of water will be less. So that can be utilized over here for calculation. Well, thanks, Imanshu. Uh, now, uh, similar to this, uh, Renuka is willing to check that uh, in case uh, there is no dedicated uh, rainwater tank in the existing building, and if we wanted to introduce the same, can we divert the rainwater through pipes into the existing fire tank or a flushing tank? Of course, uh, this can be uh, done. Uh, in fact, it has been done by a few projects where uh, they are storing the rainwater and then re they are reusing it. So, of course, the storage uh, is important. Uh, if you are reusing the water either for uh, uh, the fire uh, hydrant or for any other purpose, that is fine with us. So, it is, it is more important that you store and reuse uh, than if, if possible if in the project. Uh, okay, now coming to the material sections, uh, uh, which has been having a major contribution on the health of the indoor environment quality. Uh, Mr. Ganesh Patel is asking that is the biodegradable housing housekeeping material is to be used, the chemical is to be used in the green buildings? Uh, of course, uh, see, uh, most of the uh, Eco-friendly housekeeping chemicals that we see are one or the other way biodegradable, and that is why this is one of the criteria which has been put forth in the Green Pro certification. Also, if you see, uh, this is one of the ways to check whether uh, the uh, chemicals are acceptable or not. But just being biodegradable does not warrant that your chemical is a green chemical because there may be uh, several other toxins. Uh, which may be available in these chemicals, which may be harmful for the environment. So uh, we would recommend to either go for a green pro certified uh, chemicals or green seal or equivalent, which can be used in the project. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, someone is also willing to know whether we can do surcharging or recharging the aquifer instead of reusing it. And uh, while we have been considering the rainwater harvesting system, are we eligible? Uh, sorry, can you repeat, Puneet? There was a breakage. Okay, so uh, rather than reusing it, the rainwater, uh, uh, whether surcharging or recharging of aquifer uh, can be considered? 
yes, both these methods are considered for uh, rainwater harvesting uh, calculation. So you can either recharge uh, through a percolation pit, or uh, let's say uh, a rainwater harvesting tank, and uh, or you can store it and reuse. Uh, it is based on the project uh, team how to utilize this water. Um, uh, okay, and uh, uh, someone is willing to ask uh, the the names of the toxic housekeeping chemicals. So I, I wish, I, if you allow me, I would rephrase the questions that what would be the the way to identify a particular product is a a, a particular housekeeping chemical is a is a green certified products or not? Uh, well, there, there are two ways to do that. One is if you already have a green pro certified uh, chemical, let's suppose say they will have the green pro mark, which was shown in one of the slides. Uh, you can also search for uh, the uh, chemicals on the green pro website or on the equivalent website. Let's suppose say you are, you are using a green seal certified uh, chemical or equivalent. Uh, then you can go to their website and these uh, chemicals are listed over there with their uh, uh, properties, whether they are green or not. So you can always uh, okay. uh, go to these websites and such. Hmm. And uh, uh, see these uh, uh, green housekeeping chemicals, they are also a little costier than the standard one. So how to justify the cost variation to the purchase people? OK, so this is uh, we, we have seen a reduction in cost, of course. Even now, uh, many of the green housekeeping chemicals are a bit pricier. But if you look at the overall benefit, so they're beneficial for the user, they're beneficial for the environment, they do not have any toxic chemicals, they are biodegradable. And uh, the companies which are manufacturing these chemicals are using friendly methods for manufacturing. So even in, so when you certify a green pro chemical, it is not just the chemical itself, whether it is green or not, but whether the process is green or not, that is also taken into account. So I would say these benefits would surpass any other, uh, you know, monetary benefits that you talk about, uh, even if they are costlier. And the more the, you, you use, the, the lower the cost would be, I would say. Mm -hmm. Fine. Um, uh, uh, I think that uh, the uh, installation on at GBC Hyderabad, the bifacial solar PV panels has also generated a lot of traction and uh, interest. Now, uh, uh, one interesting uh, question uh, is coming that uh, what would be the cost implication in case someone opt for a bifacial solar panel and whether it is feasible? Uh the cost, uh, I think costing is something that I don't have readily available with me right now. Uh, probably to the person who has asked the question, we can send the details separately after inquiring from our department. And uh, however, uh, talking about uh, whether it is possible or not, yes, it is possible. It is a bit costlier than the conventional system. Uh, it will take some time for, uh, you know, uh, getting into the market. But of course, this is something that is uh, very beneficial for projects where the space is a constraint. So mostly you'll go for bifacial where the space is a constraint for higher yield of power. Mm -hmm. So uh, before moving to the, the, the other technical questions and queries, uh, there are a couple of queries related to the certification uh, uh, requirement and processes. So uh, I'll take a couple of questions uh, directly. Uh, Swamik has been asking that uh, what would be the approx certification duration and inspection process to check the building quality and requirement? Uh, Himanshu, would you like to answer? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the, the, the question? The approx certification duration and inspection process to check the building quality and requirement. This question has been posed by Mr. Swami. See, ideally it takes somewhere around close to three to six months for uh, certification, which includes uh, the release of uh, preliminary and final review, as well as uh, the site visits. Of course, currently when we are talking about the site visits are not feasible for 
the next two to three months, the site visits were not possible. So they that could be a challenge, but we are coming uh, uh, out with a methodology whereby we can overcome this challenge also. Uh, but ideally, just uh, talking about the time frame, it takes somewhere around close to six months for any existing building to get certified. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, there is a couple of queries related to uh, the sewage treatment. Probably there is a problem in the connection. Yeah, sorry. Uh, let me just check on. Can I share my papers in the screen? Check. Uh, is it better? Am I yes, audible? Audience, am I audible? To me, you are. Okay. So I'm posing another. Uh, Mr. Parikshit is willing to ask uh, to check the electric car charging point capacity. Or any other specific requirement? Uh, as per the model building uh, bylaw, which has been uh, published in 2016, around uh, uh, it's about 20% is recommended. 20% uh, of the, the parking space to have uh, uh, charging space. Uh, there's no specific requirement as as of now in the current rating system. Uh, uh, however, in the new rating system, uh, the new version, which is uh, going to be released very soon. Uh, the requirement for electric charging charging points are there. <laughs> you can always refer to the so, model building uh, bylaws as well as uh, one uh, uh, document which has been uh, released by Ministry of Power for, uh, for such guidelines. Uh, OK, uh, Ashura is willing to check uh, that uh, she wanted to develop a roof garden on the existing building. Huh? Is there any, do you want to throw some light on the what kind of a treatment or a precautions to be taken care for this? Uh, it is very important uh, to uh, you know, treat the, the, the roof before you implement a roof garden because and otherwise uh, there will be seepage, there will be leakages and all. So it is, uh, it is very important to treat uh, the, uh, the roof before this. Uh, uh, we we have a specific guideline for that. In fact, I can share a presentation on that uh, to, uh, to the participant for for the uh, you know treatment of uh, roof as well as then implementation of roof cut. Yeah. So similarly, uh, uh, Archana has been asking if she is representing the SNDT Women's University Juhu campus. She's saying that uh, there is a. Uh, in case there is a leakage problem, post installation of a solar PV panel on a rooftop, uh, what do you recommend to do? Uh, leakage problem as in because of the installation of the roof, uh, solar rooftop? Uh, probably yes, the question says so. Uh, it is, uh, I, I believe you have to treat the roof for the, for the leakages in that case. Uh, in, in fact, uh, when we are talking about the treatment of roof also, it is very important to treat the roof when we are implementing the uh, the, the solar uh, rooftop system. Because uh, in, in case that you are drilling the uh, drilling a small hole into the, the roof, uh, it might uh, have, uh, you know, resulted into uh, some amount of cracks and all which would uh, result in seepage. So it is important that uh, you address during this, uh, during the implementation of the roof, rooftop, roof, rooftop solar EV. 
I, I don't know whether I have been able to answer that, but uh, uh, probably she'll have to elaborate what is the specific problem to address that. Uh, Puneet, you, 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 you're on mute. Uh, thanks, Imanshu. Uh, so probably uh, the uh, civil activities might have been compromised uh, either initially or during the installation. So this problem uh, might have uh, came up. It is good to have the problem showing the face so that we can have the rectified measures implemented to save or to enhance the age of the structure. Uh, similar to the rain uh, uh, water or runoff that uh, uh, if we collect, uh, someone has asked anonymously that if we collect the roof run roof runoff and in calculation the capacity complies, but the non roof runoff are drained out. Is it considered? No, for green building certification, both roof and non roof areas are considered or calculation of uh, one day rainfall or certification. Now, so in case uh, you are able to uh, have uh, the uh, compliance with the only not only the roof uh, uh, runoff, then it is fairly OK. But the calculation, the requirement, the benchmarking should be based on a roof and a non roof areas. Uh, Puni, that's actually hope, going uh, the, the uh, a simple way to answer this is when we are calculating the amount of roof and non roof runoff available to us. Uh, I don't think it is possible that you can have more runoff than what is uh, calculated. Right, so mm -hmm. in a sense, when we have to go back to the calculation, when we are seeing what is the amount of water or rainwater which is available for both roof, roof and non roof areas. So both okay. of would these would uh, be considered for uh, compliance. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you. Uh, now there are a few more queries related to the indoor air quality and specific to this COVID-19 uh, lockdown scenario. Uh, Keithy has been uh, uh, willing to check. Is there any Indian standards for maintaining the indoor air quality? Of course, uh, in Indian standard. One such standard is HRA's uh, indoor environment quality standard 10001 which can be referred uh, for the indoor environment quality uh, for buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ankush is willing to check. Manchu, may I? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, Ankush is willing to check whether, uh, how will we arrange to do things in regard with construction work after lockdown? means the protections for the uh, any guide, any such guidelines post lockdown for the construction work. Yes, I believe I have spoken about uh, this particular guideline. Uh, of course, this is not the platform where we are discussing in detail about uh, the guideline because a lot of things have been uh, spoken about in this particular guideline. So uh, probably Pranit, we'll be putting uh, this document up on our website and uh, people can assess from there. Uh, so this has been released just yesterday, the guideline for uh, uh, post COVID uh, situation in Green Building. So you can, anybody can refer that for uh, uh, this. And then if you, if they have further questions, they can come back to us. I think all these sure. questions have already been addressed in, in this particular document. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are other interesting things uh, which has been checked that in the glazed, Nikhil is posing this query, in a glazed, or envelope design due to the presence of windows having provision of a fresh air intake is an issue in view of the guidelines to increase the fresh air circulation and flow in times of covid can we go for having openable windows installed by replacing the dgu panel installed uh, when when uh, uh, there was uh, some disturbance, but uh, I think I have been able to understand the question. 
uh, I believe uh, people are uh, the, the, uh, the question which has been asked is related to whether or not to introduce openable windows in glazing areas. I, I hope that is correct. Yeah. So uh, uh, if if at all the building is able to meet the requirement of ventilation, uh, this is not necessary. Uh, that being said, of course, uh, WHO and the CDC and others have spoken about uh, ventilation through uh, windows and openable areas also. But uh, introducing new windows in, in, in these uh, glazed areas may not be the uh, a very good solution. Mm, well, thanks, uh, thanks, Himanshu. Uh, now, uh, one uh, another interesting question which comes to me is uh, that is there any benchmark value for a specific energy consumption of a person living in a green building? It is about per person energy consumption benchmark. Uh, I, this is an interesting uh, question, in fact, Puneet. Uh, I have not come around any such uh, benchmark till now, but of course uh, the point uh, raised over here is, is really uh, valid because uh, we need to look at uh, the energy performance of buildings, both in terms of uh, the area as well as people. Uh, in fact, uh, EPI in terms of area is what has been published till date, uh, where we are talking about energy consumption per square foot or per square meter of area per year. Uh, year. However, no such data is available for energy consumption per person per uh, per year. Uh, so that baseline is not available with us, of course, uh, but each building can have their own baselines and uh, they can compare the per person consumption uh, and that can become a bench baseline or benchmark for them to reduce uh, the energy consumption in future. Um. Finally, as we have been uh, reaching to the time limit, so I'm just taking the two last questions. One is uh, Arshana is willing to check that uh, there are uh, uh, news that to avoid air conditioning system in offices post COVID-19. Do IGPC guidelines uh, are saying anything on this? Uh Specifically, no. So, uh, for an example, when we talk about uh, uh, the air conditioning system, a very important aspect to understand is whether or not my air conditioning system is helping in uh, spread of the COVID. So, uh, it is not, or it is not, uh, you know, all the uh, guidelines across the world. They do not talk about this. Uh, uh, there are several publications which have happened in this regard. And they do not uh, support the fact that uh, uh, it would be spreading through the ventilation system. Uh, that being said, it is important that you do not recirculate the air uh, in a building, for example. So uh, our rating or our guideline would talk about in, uh, you know, inclusion of more fresh air. Uh, recirculation should be stopped for at least some time after the start of the building. These are some of the important aspects. It is also important to understand how is the transmission methodology, uh, and uh, that would help us in understanding what are the ways uh, uh, this would spread. Uh, ventilation is not uh, part of this. Uh, so you can always go to the guideline and you can refer. Uh, OK, the last question is we are already at a 12.01. So uh, Prakash is uh, willing to check uh, that how to install or deploy the lighting light pipes uh, in a multi-storied building and when the area is uh, having a heavy rainfall. Uh, it is important to understand where and all uh, you can implement a, a light pipe. Uh, for a high rise building, it, is, it may not be recommended. Uh, in fact, uh, there we can talk about uh, infiltration of daylighting uh, through the facade area and not through uh, uh, the light pipe. Uh, this is recommended for uh, a let, let's say a two or three story building where it is possible for you to uh, bring in the light to, to the uh, expected areas. So I would not recommend it for a for a high rise building. OK, uh, thanks, Imanshu, and uh, thank you very much for the enlightening uh, question and answer sessions. And uh, thank you for all the participants for posing such a challenging questions 
and I believe that uh, uh, many of the queries has been answered. There would be few queries which we would be reverting individually. Um, and with this, I'd like to thank Himanshu to be with us uh, for the, in the last uh, two hours. We have learned a lot on the existing building conversion into the green certified green building. So uh, thank you, Himanshu. And uh, uh, for all the participants and the listeners, uh, thank you. You've been very wonderful and attentive and you have posed so many questions. So we have been very thankful. You may stay in touch with us. Uh, we would be sharing the recording of uh, the, the entire lecture to all the registered participants. And on the email, you may also reward in case you have many more questions. Uh, uh, I would also like to thank uh, my colleague Neelesh, who has been hosting and arranging and then sharing this information with uh, all of you. Thank you, Neelesh. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Manju. We are closing for the day. Thank you. Thank you, Puneet. Thank you. Thank you for the session. Yeah.